Shabbat Shalom. There is a stunning midrash told by the rabbis of the Talmud about an exchange that took place around the time of creation. God declared to the angelic council, let us create man in our image, to which a group of angels stepped forward and offered the following counsel. Lord of the universe, consider first humanity's potential for evil. They will lie, they will murder, they will create weapons to destroy your world. We beg of you, do not go forward with your plan. But so great was God's desire to create a human partner that no argument was going to be countenanced. So God, being God, stretched out the divine finger, let loose a burst of energy, and zapped the dissenting angels to a crisp. A second group of angels similarly came forth before the divine throne, making a similar case regarding the human propensity to steal, to cheat, to commit adultery, and so one, and so on, and so forth, and they too were similarly zapped by God. The pattern continued for a few more rounds, the angels predicting all the foibles and frailties of the proposed humans, until finally the angels grudgingly acquiesced to the divine will saying, Kol ma she'ata rotze la'asot ve'olam cha ase. Roughly meaning, God, the world is yours. Do as you see fit. And thus the first human being was created. Provocative as the rabbinic story may be, what makes it even more remarkable, as my late teacher, Rabbi Yochanan Mufs, explained is that we know that all of the predictions of the angels came true. The entire Bible, and for that matter, the entire tale of human history, one human failing after another, one big angelic, I told you so, it wouldn't take long. Eat of any fruit of the garden, save one, God instructed Adam and Eve, a commandment that was still warm even it was being breached. And if the first generation of humanity gave into temptation and desire, it would be in the hands of the next generation that would be stained with blood. Cain killing his brother Abel, followed by making weapons of iron, the very instruments of war. Faster than you can say Liz Truss, God regretted having created humanity, regretted according to the commentators, having ignored the advice of the angelic retinue. It's a state of affairs, of course, that comes to a head this week in the generation of Noah, a generation whose violence, whose sinfulness, whose impropriety was pervasive and entrenched. Every thought devised by the human mind, nothing but evil all the time, a state of affairs culminating in what is perhaps one of the most extraordinary verses of the Bible thus far, if not altogether, and the Lord regretted, vayinachem, to have created humanity. Accustomed as, as we may be to biblical anthropomorphisms, talking about God's outstretched arm, God's mighty hand, God walking into the garden, God feeling regret is a theological leap of an altogether different order of magnitude. God is perfect. God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing. Regret signals a misstep. Regret signals disappointment over the past. God is God, God doesn't make mistakes. What are we to do of a God who regrets? Regret, as defined in Daniel Pink's book on the subject, is, quote, the unpleasant feeling associated with some action or inaction a person has taken which has led to a state of affairs that he or she wishes were different. In management terms, regret is a feeling created by a comparison between the actual outcome and that outcome that would have occurred had the decision maker made a different choice. More than merely identifying a mistake, regret is that pit in the stomach when we shuttle between the past and the present. We see the facts of our present circumstance and we look back knowing that had we have made a different decision, our present would not only be different, but it would be better. Had we bought that stock, had we kept up with playing piano, 
had we chosen our words more carefully, had we not gotten that tattoo, our lives are filled with regrets, big ones, little ones, and ones in between. The feeling of regret is a category usually placed with negative emotions, with anger and guilt and disgust, all of which is why, as Pink explains, our world is one which tries to live without regret. A life well lived, as the song goes, is a life with no regrets. In the words of the late great justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, waste no time on regret. And while I might understand and even appreciate our cultural avoidance of regret, our efforts to deny or suppress all of the could have, would have, should haves we accumulate over our lifetime, our tradition actually teaches us otherwise. The Hebrew word for regret, as noted, is vayinachem, as in God regretting having created humanity. It's how the word nacham is used in our Torah reading. It's how the word nacham is used throughout the Bible in its reflexive or nephal form, for instance, and God regretted having made Saul king, amongst other such examples. But the wonders of the Hebrew language are that the same root, nun chet mem, in its transitive or pl form, means at least two other things. First, it means to turn away, to change, or to repent. For example, in the book of Exodus, when God's ready to destroy Israel following the sin of the golden calf, God turns away or repents from the intent to exercise the divine wrath. Or in the story of Jonah, which we just read on Yom Kippur, Nacham is used to describe God turning away from the plan to destroy the wicked city of Nineveh. And then, even more interestingly, sometimes the root Nacham, Nunchet Mem, isn't used to mean regret or to turn away, but to comfort. When Joseph's brothers, for instance, fear that their once spurned brother will exact vengeance upon them, he calms them. In the text it says, Vayenachemotam, he comforts them. In Isaiah chapter 40, when God seeks to assure Israel that their sufferings have run their course, God calls out to them and says, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, comfort thee, comfort thee, my people. When Jeremiah speaks of cup of consolation or of comfort, it's called a kostan chumim. Think of the Hebrew names, Menachem or Nechama, a word typically associated not with regret or turning away, but the most affirming of human activities to offer comfort. One word, Nacham, a word with so many meanings, to regret, to change one ways, to comfort, and even if, or especially if, the subtleties of the Hebrew language are not in your wheelhouse, the thread connecting all of the meanings of Nacham sit in plain sight and suggest an alternative Jewish way to look at regret, as felt by God and by humanity. Namely, rather than treating regret as a burden to avoid or deny, see it as an opportunity to turn, to change one's ways, and eventually to be comforted. We need regret. We need to surround ourselves with people ready and capable of expressing regret, because a person who regrets is a person who is capable of reflection, is a person capable of taking agency for the missteps of their lives and hopefully to self-correct. The inability to regret signals the inability for moral growth and personal growth. The ability to regret signals a willingness, if not an insistence, to let the could've, would've, should'ves of our past shape our brighter future. Pink offers the image of photo negatives of yesteryear that some of us in the room might remember, how in the days before digital photography, one would receive a small strip of film where the light spots were dark and the dark spots were light, but when printed on a piece of photographic paper, the light and the dark are reversed. Regret can work the same way. We look back, we see the dark spots, but when overlaid onto the blank page of our future, 
the dark spots have become opportunities for introspection, for change, for growth, and for light. Look, as a rabbi, as a parent, as a human being, I'm not proud of my mistakes. Regrets, I have more than a few, too many to mention. I don't post them on Facebook, but I know what they are. In all their squirminess, I try my best to own them, and more importantly, to learn from them. I remember years ago when I was just starting out as a rabbi in Chicago, I received a phone call from someone who was nearing the end of life and that a visit from the rabbi would be appreciated. I thought it could wait until the next day. It couldn't. The person died overnight. And I learned that day that there are no second chances when it comes to deathbed prayers, which is why ever since, if a call comes in in such a circumstance, I make sure that that person gets a visit then and there. At the other end of life, I remember a young couple soon after my arrival at Park Avenue who asked me to stretch beyond my comfort zone and be present at their chuppah, their wedding canopy. And for certain reasons, I declined. In the years since, I've wondered if my refusal to officiate dampened their willingness to create a Jewish home. I still have my lines. Every rabbi of integrity has to. But I wonder how I could have, would have, and should have done it differently. And I don't just wonder. I do do it differently today, if not for that couple, because of them, and for couples like them seeking an on-ramp into the Jewish tradition. I have my fair share of regrets, regrets of action, regrets of inaction, misdeeds and spoken words in all aspects of my life. I name them, I learn from them, I hope people can forgive me for them, and I grow from them, all with the hope that one day I will be comforted by them. All of which brings us back to where it started. Is it possible that an all-powerful God experienced regret? This week, I'm heartened by the thought that yes, God can and did feel regret for having ignored the advice of the angels. Because we know that after the flood, God leveraged that regret into something else, creating that rainbow, signaling God's willingness to bear humanity's suffer shortcomings, to suffer our flaws and exist in covenant with us, even if, especially if, we continue to fall short of God's high hopes. And I think to myself that if God was able to turn regret into comfort, then how much more so should we, a flawed humanity created in the divine image, to be, to err, is to be human, but to regret, the Torah seems to be teaching, is divine, a point that we should not avoid, but that is the very point itself. After all, and lest we forget, the name of the protagonist of our story is Noah, a name which the Torah explains comes from our self-same word, meaning both to regret and to comfort. Noah is at one and the same time the instrument of both God's regret and comfort. And we stand here today, as did Noah, on the deck of the ark after the flood. The waters of our past failures are receding, but we're not yet sure if it's safe to venture out. And so we set that dove free, a reminder that the forward momentum of our lives is as much about acknowledging our past as it is about letting go. We live, we learn. We cry, we learn. We lose, we learn. We regret and we learn, stepping forth onto dry land, one foot after the other, ever aspiring, but never arriving at the rainbow that sits before us on the horizon. Shabbat Shalom.